Good morning. Thanks for being here. I'm Stephen Romo. And I'm Zinclair Samoa. Joe and Savannah are off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, decision day again. This morning, polls are back open in Georgia for one final midterms contest. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is claiming momentum against Republican challenger Herschel Walker in what's become the longest, most contentious race of the year. Georgia is better than Herschel Walker. Period. If we sit on the sideline, y'all see what we're going to get. Oh we're going to get people that uh, you can't trust anymore. And already this runoff race has seen a record turnout. We have team coverage with the latest. In the dark this morning, tens of thousands of people waking up to another day without power in North Carolina after gunfire at two major electrical substations. More on what investigators are calling a targeted attack, plus why restoring power could take several more days. Remembering an icon tributes this morning to Emmy Award winning actress Kirstie Alley, who died at the age of 71. We'll look back on her decades long career in Hollywood. And Gen Z in 2023, believe it or not, it's almost the new year, and that means new trends. We'll break down a new report by Instagram on what matters right now to the younger generation and how it could shape culture in the coming year. I gotta say, Gen Z to me, they're really cool. Yeah, too cool. I, it's intimidating. I like it. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> it's good to see you this morning. But we begin with that high stakes runoff in Georgia. Yeah, this morning, after days of record early voting turnout, voters are heading to the polls one more time to decide on the runoff between incumbent U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger, Herschel Walker. More than 1.8 million male and early in person ballots have already been cast potentially giving Warnock an edge while Walker is banking on turnout today to take the lead. Get out and vote because if you don't vote, you're going to get more Chuck Schumer and also uh, President Biden. We know that he is unprepared. We know he's unqualified. He's unfit to represent the people of Georgia in the United States Senate. We have full team coverage of today's crucial election on the ground with NBC News correspondent Tremaine Lee and senior political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Greg Bluestein. Good morning to both of you. And Tremaine, starting off with you, if you could take us through the state of the race and where do we stand on Election Day, what both candidates are going to do today. That's right, Stephen. That's right, Stephen. You mentioned that, that heavy early vote turnout, which uh, favored Democrats. But both of these candidates, uh, Senator Warnock and uh, Herschel Walker, are hoping for a heavy turnout today. As you can see behind me, there's already a line uh, gathering at this polling place. It's kind of a, a cold, wet, and rainy day. But both of these candidates uh, are hoping for heavy turnout. Uh, Reverend Warnock, because he says the fight's not over until it's over, so he wants everyone to still come out, even though uh, they feel good with the momentum they have. Uh, but Herschel Walker is hoping that uh, those Republicans who might not have voted early, they tend not to. They tend to show up the day of Election Day. He's hoping that they turn out. And so both of these men are out uh, doing meeting greets and canvassing uh, in the suburbs of Atlanta today. Uh, but again, it's the polls just opened. There's already a line behind me. And this is exactly uh, what these candidates are hoping for. So, Greg, of course, this is not the first time Georgia has been at the center of a high stakes runoff election. What are you watching for today? I'm watching for Election Day turnout. It's so huge, as we just heard. Uh, it seems like Senator Warnock built a solid advantage in early voting. That's because more voters in Democratic strongholds voted than in Republican strongholds, and a disproportionately high number of African American voters cast ballots, and they tend to uh, back uh, the Democrats overwhelmingly. And so Republicans are relying on huge election day turnout today. Uh, Herschel Walker, if he doesn't get a surge of, of turnout at the polls, he does not win. So, Tremaine, unlike 2020, this is not a race where the fate of the Senate is on the line, but there were more than 77,000 new voters, people who did not vote in November, who did turn out for the runoff. So what do you think is motivating people this time around to show up when they didn't just a couple months ago? You know, I've been talking to a number of organizers who say that, you know what, the stakes were so high that they had to pull out all the stops, right? The machinery and apparatus of voting, um, especially here in Georgia, which is kind of ground zero uh, for this kind of mobilization, uh, that folks are, are making the message clear that the stakes are too high to stay home. Now, Republicans are hoping that uh, those folks, again, who, who might not have showed up before, that they show up today uh, without uh, Governor Kemp on the ticket, which, you know, drew a lot of Republicans out. It may be tough for them, but again, uh, the stakes are so high in this election. Even without the balance of power, um, you know, clear, the, the Democrats could get a clear majority if um, Senator Warnock retains his seat, and that's what they're hoping for. 
And it just looks so uncomfortable right there, Jermaine. We see people in line behind you, like you mentioned. So, Greg, early voting traditionally has favored Democrats. As we've heard, Senator Warnock has held a very narrow lead in many of the polls. So what does Herschel Walker have to do to actually flip that seat? Well, he's trying to drive up that early, that, that, that election day turnout itself. He's now trying to make the case that this race is a, uh, is a referendum on Joe Biden, is a referendum on Democratic control of the U.S. Senate. Um, he said at his final campaign stop last night that a vote for uh, Senator Warnock is a vote for Chuck Schumer, is a vote for Joe Biden. That's a case that he's struggled to make in, in recent weeks. He's instead focused more on culture war issues, transgender sports, gendered pronouns, issues like that that are motivating to some in the, in the far right base but aren't as appealing to the middle of the road voters that he frankly lost a big number of them in the November midterm. We saw 200,000 fewer voters back him than Governor Brian Kemp, his fellow Republican, in that November midterm. And so Senator Warnock, he is making a clear and sustained appeal to those swing voters by saying that he can work across party lines, that he can work with, with, with Republicans and, of course, with Democrats as well. Uh, Herschel Walker, he wants to nationalize this race and make it, make it all about Joe Biden and his 40 percent or so approval rating here in Georgia. It'll be interesting to see whose strategy pays off today. Jermaine, Greg, thank you. And sticking with politics and the ongoing controversies surrounding former President Trump, Republican lawmakers are being put on the spot, forced to take a stance about a recent Trump post on social media where he called for abolishing certain parts of the Constitution. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the story. The Republican Party once again forced to answer uncomfortable questions about Donald Trump. So I vehemently disagree with uh, with the statement that, that Trump has made. The party's only announced candidate for president and the GOP's de facto leader proposing on his Truth Social channel that parts of the Constitution should be terminated to allow the 2020 election to be overturned. Trump's claims of widespread election fraud are baseless, but he argues that, quote, a massive fraud of this type and magnitude allows for the termination of all rules and regulations and articles, even those found in the Constitution. Our great founders did not want, would not condone false and fraudulent elections. It is a position some Republican leaders were forced to navigate. Well, obviously, I don't support that. Uh, the Constitution is set for a reason uh, to protect the rights uh, of every American. And so I certainly don't uh, endorse uh, that language or uh, that sentiment. While some, like Congressman elect Mike Lawler, were able to distance themselves from the former president, other Republican leaders, like Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and the House Republican Leader Kevin McCarthy, have yet to respond despite repeated asks of their offices. Trump walking back his words with the following statement. The fake news is actually trying to convince the American people that I said I wanted to terminate the Constitution. This is simply more disinformation and lies. John Bolton, the former national security advisor under Trump, now one of his critics, speaking out with harsh words for his former boss. It's not merely wrong and outrageous. It is disqualifying. This just the latest in a long line of controversy that continues to surround the former president since he announced his intention to run for president again. I am tonight announcing my candidacy for president of the United States. It was less than a month ago that Trump was dining with rapper Kanye West and a white nationalist Nick Fuentes. Trump has yet to apologize for hosting the pair, and just days after their dinner, Ye, as he is now known, went on Alex Jones's Infowars to declare his admiration for Hitler. Thursday night, Trump expressing solidarity with January 6 insurrectionists in a fundraising video. People have been treated unconstitutionally, in my opinion, and very, very unfairly. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. While Trump remains the most prominent member of the GOP, there are signs even some of his Republican supporters may be open to other nominees. I just don't think that at this point he'll be able to get there because I think there's a lot of other good quality candidates out there. And the new Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, warning Republicans that Trump is only part of their problem. The Republicans are going to have to work out their issues with the former president and decide whether they're going to break from him uh, and return to some semblance of reasonableness. Our thanks to Ryan Nobles for that report. And in a statement Sunday, White House spokesman Andrew Bates said that attacking the Constitution was anathema to the soul of our nation and should be universally condemned.
And all of this is playing out as the House is back in session this morning, trying to tackle key funding issues before the end of the year. Lawmakers are fast approaching deadlines for several pieces of must-pass legislation, including government funding and defense spending. But the question is, will they be able to get anything done in this lame duck session? NBC News reporter Julie Serkin joins us now with more on this. Julie, good morning to you. So let's start with keeping the government's lights on. Pretty important. Congress funding deadline is coming up on December 16th, but some Republicans want to delay it until next year so the new Congress can have more input in all of this. So how likely is it that they're able to hash out a funding deal during the lame duck session? And what options do they have if they actually miss that deadline? Yeah, good morning. Well, look, the bad news is the government funding deadline is literally 10 days away. But the good news is we often find ourselves in this position when it comes to December, that end of the year deadline, because both sides are often pushing their work until the last minute. And that's because uh, both sides have something to gain if they stretch out the process longer and longer. So if any, uh, if the past year's are indicative of what's going to happen this year, they will likely get it together. And that's in large part because leaders on the Democratic side and on the Republican side want to get this done. There is virtually no appetite for a shutdown. There's no appetite even to kick this to next Congress, although there are some Republicans that you mentioned, especially in the House, that are looking to do this because, of course, Republicans are going to take control of the House next Congress. But look, the bottom line here is both sides in leadership want to get this done. I was talking to senators last night. They're trading numbers back and forth. Leader Schumer told me walking out of a meeting with McConnell uh, that things are moving along. They're still working. They're not there yet, but they're hoping to be there soon. Uh, and I should also note they are still $25 billion apart, but we're looking to uh, see if that could shake out in the next coming days. All right, let's talk about the defense budget, Julie. It's a major point of contention on Capitol Hill. A group of Republicans want to use that bill to end a COVID vaccine mandate for service members, and they threaten to stall that bill if the mandate is not repealed. How do we see this all playing out? Yeah, there was a press conference last week with some of those Republican members, including Rand Paul, who I should note never really votes for the NDA, that defense bill that Congress needs to pass. Uh, but there is a separate effort that's been moving over the last couple of months that I reported on yesterday of a group of Republicans in the Armed Services Committees pushing to end this mandate for service members. It's something the Biden administration put in. It's something they're still saying is a readiness issue. They're advocating uh, for the mandate to stay in place of course. Uh, but yesterday, some things kind of fell apart. I was talking to some of the top Republicans and Democrats, uh, including on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, Senator Inhofe, for example, who's the top Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, told me that Democrats are putting in extraneous last-minute asks in order to get this vaccine mandate. Uh, sort of a tit-for-tat going on here that we normally see in the last couple of weeks before the Congress ends. Uh, but all things said, uh, the National Defense Bill is a must-pass bill. There is virtually no appetite for that not to pass either. I mean, it's literally something they need to get done to keep our military running, uh, to keep our uh, partners overseas uh, funded as well. Ukraine, a great example of that. Uh, so we expect this also to be solved, but not without a political fight and exceedingly political tension. Seems like nothing happens without a political fight these days. And Julie, speaking of things that are pending, the January 6th committee also preparing a report for a December 31st deadline. Do we have any insight on what we might learn from that? Yeah, it's a great question. When the House was last in on Friday, I was chasing the halls with my colleagues, trying to get an answer to that, talking to members on the committee, and they were still coming out of a meeting. I mean, they are literally deciding as we speak how to present this, when to present this, uh, perhaps criminal referrals. Of course, the number one question on the minds of many is whether they plan to make any to the Department of Justice. Former President Trump, the number one name, of course, that they are considering in that. Uh, but look, they have until the end of the year. They know that. So they plan to present in some way. We plan to see them again, uh, I'm told, by the end of the year. This report, we don't know what setting that will be in, but all signs are pointing to some kind of meeting, some kind of uh, presentation they plan to have before they ha hit the expiration date on their committee. Mm, a lot to pay attention to. All right, Julie, thank you.
And more than 30,000 customers in North Carolina are still without power this morning, days after two major power stations were seriously damaged in what officials are calling a targeted attack. The lights in Moore County aren't expected to come back on for days. A state of emergency is in effect as investigators race to find a motive. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton joins us now from outside of the sheriff's office in Carthage, North Carolina with more. Antonia, good morning. So we know the FBI has joined in on the investigation, but what else do we know this morning? And are you hearing anything about a possible motive or who might be involved? Morning, Zinclay. Right now, we still have no information about a motive and no suspect. And this is as we're now at the third consecutive morning with people waking up without heat in their homes, in many cases without running water, and without a school for their kids to be able to go to right now. And so residents are really frustrated as there's sort of two tracks to the story now, Zinclay. One, about this community trying to get back on its feet after being destabilized by all of this, and the other piece being this investigation. This is what we do know from authorities authorities that this is an intentional attack, that they believe that there was criminal intent here from the individual or individuals involved. And they repeatedly use the word intention and then phrasing like this is a person who knew what they were doing. In other words, you know, not a group of teenagers just pulling in a, an accidental prank. They emphasize that whoever did this very much knew what they were doing that night and knew what the resulting consequences would look like. And of course, residents here and really people around the country are keeping an eye on this closely because of the concerns about what this might represent for our infrastructure more broadly and the vulnerabilities that might be there, Zinclay. Absolutely. And it's not lost to me that this is happening in December when it's already so cold. And Antonia, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper has also spoken out about this attack. What exactly did he have to say? And how is he helping residents that still, as you said, don't have power, don't have heat this morning? Well, first, the most important thing for people to know is if you're in this area in Moore County and your home is cold, you need help or resources, the county has set up a shelter and is encouraging people to take advantage of that. They're also still responding to emergency calls. You know, this is a community with a lot of elderly people who depend on things like oxygen to be connected. And the county is still sending people out and helping residents when those issues come up. But the governor, Governor Roy Cooper, really focused on this question of infrastructure and some of the national implications here. You know, the governor said, that for a long time he's been aware of potential security threats, cybersecurity threats, uh, and threats to our infrastructure, and said that likely, you know, as we learn more about the motive in this case, that is going to mean that additional security measures are going to have to be taken in communities like Moore and around the rest of the state to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Take a listen to some of his remarks. What happened here Saturday night was a criminal attack. Regardless of motive, Violence and sabotage will not be tolerated. There are multiple layers of law enforcement involved on the ground here, from the FBI to the State Bureau of Investigation, and of course, the Sheriff's Office behind me here. And we expect to hear more potentially this afternoon around 4 p.m. Zinclay. I mean, we'll be waiting for that. And Antonia, briefly, what are some of the major concerns that local officials have over these outages? Well, first, people's safety and security, because it has gotten cold at night here. It's not quite freezing temperatures today, but it's been down close to 30 and 32 at night on other days. And that poses a serious risk for the elderly people in this community, for the littlest people in our community, you know, people's infants and young toddlers trying to get through this. They don't even have schools to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, as you drive around this community, traffic lights aren't working. And so there have been concerns about potential car crashes. That's part of the reason why there's a 9 p.m. curfew in place here. So I think safety and security and people, you know, having food to eat, gas in their tanks and the resources that they need in place is the top concern of people here while they're still trying to figure out the motive here. Zinclay. Absolutely. Hoping people stay safe. Antonia Hilton. Thank you. Emmy winning actor Kirstie Alley has died of cancer, according to her family. Alley rose to fame after her breakout role as bar manager Rebecca in the NBC comedy Cheers. She went on to star alongside her friend John Travolta in the Look Who's Talking movies. More recently, she competed on Dancing with the Stars in 2011 and earlier this year was on The Masked Singer. Kirstie Alley was 71 years old. She'll be missed. And now to your weather this morning. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us with a check of our forecast. Good to see you, Michelle.
Great to see you both. And we are tracking some rain today. Some of it is heavy. Some of it will be heavy. And we could see the potential for some flash flooding, not only today, but also tomorrow. And you can see on satellite radar, most of the east is covered by rain. And we're seeing those pockets of more moderate rainfall. Uh, that's where you see those brighter colors. So portions of Georgia and the South Carolina, Tennessee, also North Carolina, and even a little isolated uh, moderate rain up in upstate New York. So we're going to see rounds of showers, rounds of rain today, and also tomorrow. That's going to pose the impact or pose a threat for flash flooding in portions of the lower Tennessee Valley, the Tennessee Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley into portions of the Southern Appalachian. So that satellite radar over the past six hours, it's all due to a warm front that's moving through. It's moving very slowly. It's bringing that heavy rain. It's bringing the potential for that flash flooding. And that rain is now expanding into the mid-Atlantic and also the Northeast. Now we're not expecting the heaviest rain in the Northeast or the mid-Atlantic. Most of that will be in the lower Tennessee Valley and also the Mississippi Valley. Uh, and then tomorrow we're going to remain on settled as well. Another cloudy and damp day in the northeast. Lingering, that lingering front is going to fuel more storms in the southeast by Thursday. And the next round of soaking rain moves into the Midwest. And we're going to see high rainfall rates. That's going to lead to more flooding. It's going to be saturated. The ground's going to be saturated. So we're going to be watching this very closely over the next several days. Locally, we could see three to five inches of rain, especially where you see those yellows and oranges. Uh, that's extending into the Ohio Valley as well. And then we do have pockets of isolated moderate, moderate rainfall amounts expected in the northeast as well. Along with that rainfall, we are warm in many spots in the east. Temperatures in December near 80 degrees in Montgomery, Alabama. That's 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. Into the mid-70s in Dallas, even into the low to mid-50s in D.C. Uh, Boston, you're warm too, 53 degrees. We'll hold on to that warmth tomorrow, 59 degrees in New York City, 13 degrees above normal for this time of year. But then we cool it down by the weekend, back to reality, into the 40s by Saturday. Back to you guys. Back Oof. to reality. Yeah, that is the word for it. All right, <laughs> Michelle, thank you. <laughs> sure. And coming up on Morning News Now, a power struggle in Ukraine after the break, the latest on the war, including the new missile wave of attacks impacting the country's power grid. Plus, the tens of millions of dollars in COVID relief stolen and who the Secret Service says could be behind what is being called an elaborate cyber attack. We'll be right back. Welcome back. With a new escalation in the war in Ukraine this morning, Moscow says Ukraine was behind explosions that rocked two military air bases deep inside Russia. According to Russia's defense ministry, the blasts were the result of a Ukrainian drone attack that killed three military personnel. For more, we're joined by NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber in Kiev. Ellison, it's good to see you. So what else can you tell us about these explosions and their significance? He's in clay. So, yeah, as far as we understand, what we're talking about are three different strikes that have been reported inside Russia. Two of them, strikes on Russian airfields pretty deep in Russia, those took place reportedly on the morning of December 5th. There was another strike this morning on an oil depot in Russia. The two strikes on Russian airfields were significant because they were so deep in Russia. We're talking about 300 miles uh, beyond the Ukrainian-Russia border. Most of the weapons that has, have been provided to Ukraine to date by Western allies, they're medium-range missiles weapons that don't really have the capability to go this far. Russia's Ministry of Defense, they're saying that Ukrainian forces used Soviet drones to hit these targets. Ukraine, they have not publicly commented, but assuming these were in fact carried out by Ukraine, which seems very likely, this suggests not only a new willingness by Ukrainian forces to push the fight to military bases in Russia, but it also suggests their weapons capability and their ability to use weapons effectively to attack Russia at a distance is perhaps growing. So Ukraine, they've asked Western allies to send more long-range missiles, but up until now, Western allies, the U.S. included, they have not agreed to do that. They've been hesitant to do that because they fear that it will bring NATO into this conflict and that the conflict will become even bigger than it is right now. But what this appears to show is that perhaps, given that Russia's Ministry of Defense is saying these were drones that are Soviet-era drones, that Ukraine has figured out a way to sort of do the longer, further away stuff on their own. There's this discussion when we're talking about uh, this fight of if 
Ukraine can actually be successful if they're only able to use the majority mm. of the weapons that they have within their own borders, right? The argument is they need to go and take this fight directly at the source, hit the places where Russia is firing these missiles instead of intercepting them when they're already in the air over mm. Kyiv. They've asked for those weapons from the West. They haven't gotten it. But what it looks like here is they figured out a way to use some of the stuff they had, Soviet-era weapons, to sort of achieve those goals. And from a military standpoint, Sinclair, it could suggest a shift in the way this war is being fought. Sinclair. And Ellison, you talked about uh, missiles being fired. Russia fired a barrage of missiles into Ukraine yesterday, including Kyiv, where you are. Those strikes, I know, impaired electricity and water in several regions. So as temperatures dip below freezing, what is the feeling on the ground there? Are people worried about more attacks? Yeah, I mean, Russian forces fired more than 70 missiles, according to Ukrainian forces, yesterday. And that yesterday was one of the coldest days of winter so far. About 60 of those were reportedly intercepted. Ten headed towards Kyiv. Nine of those intercepted. But three different regions, Odessa, Kyiv, Venetia, they all... Uh, According to local local officials there, they all saw energy infrastructure hit by these missile strikes, and it sent a lot of people into darkness. The power was out, electricity, no heat, difficulty accessing water, if at all. When you talk to Ukrainian people, uh, it's, it's hard to kind of capture the layers of emotions they often feel. There's stress, there's sadness, there's fear, there's bravery, there's anger, there's hope, there's a lot there. But one thing we consistently see and what we saw in the days leading up to this latest missile attack were communities coming together. That's how a lot of people in places like Kyiv are fighting back right now. They will tell you that these missile strikes aren't breaking them. Instead, they're coming together. Mm. They're building warming centers so they can take care of each other and look out for their neighbors and just weather this until they hope it ends and they hope it's soon. Zinclay. Yeah, the nuances of war. Ellison Barber, thank you for covering it for us. All right, turning now to an NBC News exclusive. Hackers linked to the Chinese government stole at least $20 million in COVID relief funds, according to the Secret Service. This would also be the first instance of pandemic fraud connected to foreign cyber criminals. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. So, Ken, good morning to you. Just how serious is this fraud that the Secret Service is talking about? Good morning, Stephen. Well, the context here is that there was a massive amount of fraud in pandemic relief programs, particularly the unemployment programs, as much as $400 billion, as much as 40 percent of all the money that the federal government handed out in special unemployment benefits was stolen. And about half of that, experts tell us, went to foreign criminal groups. And so this is a specific subset. It's a small number in the context, $20 million, but it may just be the tip of the iceberg, that the Secret Service says was stolen by a particular Chinese hacking group with ties to Chinese intelligence. And that's what's really significant here, is that this wasn't just some run-of-the-mill criminal group. This was a group of hackers that has been identified by the U.S. government and by private experts as having participated in Chinese government-backed hacks before. Some members of this group have been indicted by the Justice Department. So these are the A-team of hackers, and it's believed that they infiltrated state government systems and stole at least $20 million. And that really alarms our sources, Stephen. Now, Ken, we've heard a lot about these COVID relief fraud cases. This is the first we've heard that's tied to a foreign state-sponsored cyber criminal group that the U.S. has acknowledged publicly anyway. Are there any other instances that the government may have not told us about? The, our sources are indicating that there may well be, that they continue to investigate. They can't. They don't believe that this, this one instance of $20 million is the only one. One person told us they believe this Chinese hacking group probably targeted all 50 states because the sad reality is this was easy pickings. I mean, the state unemployment systems use antiquated 1980s computer systems. These programs were designed really without security in mind. They wanted to get the money out quickly, and they were just pillaged by all manner of criminal groups. And so these sophisticated hackers found an easy time in stealing this money, Stephen. Yeah, we've heard about these thefts basically happening since the very beginning of these relief funds being distributed. So is there anything the government can do in the future to prevent this same type of fraud? 
There's a lot they can do. The Labor Department Inspector General has been begging for years that states upgrade their computer systems, for example. And sadly, there doesn't seem to be a lot of political will to do it because it would cost a lot of money. Again, antiquated systems, not a lot of checks for fraud. The people that pay close attention to this say the federal government, state governments need to do a lot more to make sure that this never happens again, Stephen. Certainly a lot of work to be done, and it does come with a price tag. Kendallanian, thank you. Now to California, where celebrity lawyer Michael Avenetti was sentenced yesterday to 14 years in prison for fraud. Avenetti, known for representing adult entertainment star Stormy Daniels in lawsuits against former President Trump, was accused of cheating four of his clients out of millions of dollars and obstructing the IRS's efforts to collect taxes from his coffee business. This latest sentence will run consecutively after the five-year prison term he is currently serving for two separate convictions here in New York. Well, coming up this morning, growing concerns about the so-called triple demic. Up next, the new warning about a significant surge in cases of COVID, RSV, and the flu, plus tips on how to keep your family healthy. And have you heard of gentle parenting, the controversial and at times confusing trend taking over TikTok? Next on Morning News Now. We're back taking a look at the latest on the triple threat plaguing hospitals. The recent surge in RSV cases appear to be slowing down, but flu and COVID cases are still on the rise. And that's as new numbers from the CDC show flu hospitalizations reaching record highs while average daily COVID cases are spiking. NBC News correspondent Perry Russom joins us now for more. Perry, good morning. So the CDC numbers show that flu cases spiked during Thanksgiving week. What's driving this increase in cases? Is it the nature of all the gatherings we see during the holidays? And are doctors concerned that the spike will continue as people prepare for other holidays like Hanukkah, Christmas? And remember, we have New Year's Eve coming up as well, really the first time since the pandemic started that we are going to have strangers celebrating inside in large numbers. Look, the CDC says simply, Flu season is just starting earlier, significantly earlier than they expected. And in terms of hospitalizations for the flu for this time of year, we are seeing numbers that we haven't seen in a decade. And the main question that is being asked right now, does this mean that flu season will spike and go down sooner, or are we going to see a prolonged season? In terms of vaccination rates for some of those most at risk, the elderly and children, the CDC says vaccination rates are lower compared to last year. And we asked a doctor here in Chicago about what can be done. It's never too late to get vaccine. Um, you know, for influenza, even if you have just had influenza last week, there's actually four strains of flu that are covered in the vaccine. Uh, influenza A is what's out and about right now. I fully expect influenza B to come later in the year, which is how it usually does. So there's still absolutely value to getting your vaccine uh, and COVID boosters as well. And some good news from the CDC in terms of the flu vaccine. They say this year's vaccine is working well with the current strains that are going around. So, Perry, we know hospitals across the country are already stretched thin due to RSV and COVID. And yesterday, the CDC put out numbers showing the average daily COVID hospital admissions have increased about 18 percent over the last two weeks. So what effect will the rise in COVID and flu have on those already strained hospitals? Well, today we are seeing some of the effects starting today in Indiana. Some hospitals in Indiana, because of the flu, they are restricting visitors. So only immediate family can visit two at a time under the age of 18, and they have to wear masks at all times. So we are already seeing this happen here in the Midwest. And Perry, you mentioned it, right? Inevitably, people will be gathering during the holidays. That's what this time is about. So what can people do to stay safe this holiday season, to stay out of the hospital? I see you're in front of a hospital right now. So we took this question to Dr. Bartlett yesterday, and she says, look, COVID, the flu, RSV, these are things that we simply are going to have to live with. But she says, wash your hands, make sure you're visiting people that you know or family, if you can, visit outside. And as she told us, make sure you get vaccinated. Important message there. Perry, thank you. All right, it's time now for our weekly mental health check-in. New research shows COVID might be altering the structure of teenage brains. We have more on what you need to know. Plus, we look at a new style for raising kids that's taking over social media called gentle parenting. It sounds nice. We have questions about it. We'll ask. 
the award-winning psychotherapist and reporter, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Doctor. Thank you for having me. We wanted to ask about that study, the effects of COVID on teenage brains. So how could this change the structure and how could that affect mental health? Mm -hmm. So what the study looked at was how stress impacts the brain. And what they found was it seemed to age the brain, which is not good. Mm -hmm. So for those out there who think, oh, it's just stress, it's all in your head, now we're able to see that there are physiological changes. And those changes lead to mood issues. So it's really a powerful study, and I think it helps people to realize that it's not just your emotions or it's just all in your head, mm -hmm. that this is pretty dangerous. And let's talk about something I've been seeing a lot on TikTok, which is gentle parenting. A lot of the uh -huh. new parents in my life are talking about it. What are the benefits? What exactly is it? And what do you think of it as a form of discipline or maybe a lack of discipline something? I think the word gentle throws everybody off because we think of being permissive, and that's not what this is about. It's about connecting to your child and having appropriate expectations and setting limits based on that. So the study show that if you are shaming your child or yelling at your child, that it basically makes them anxious, with low self-esteem, it could lead to substance abuse disorders. So this is a different way of connecting to your child so that their psyche is intact and they feel understood. Yeah, so remembering that they have agency too. Yeah. That's yeah, great. It's more than just gentleness, it sounds like. Yeah, I think the word, I, th I like the idea of thoughtful parenting because mm. it's really thinking through what does your child need, not being highly reactive and being proactive in your approach when it's possible. Mm. And finally, Doctor, talking about the holidays, they are here. We're seeing warnings about romanticizing the holidays, which yeah. I guess happens all the time. Uh, we see these TV movies that make it all look amazing and incredible. Are there some risks associated with that for ourselves and also the people we're putting pressure on? Yeah, I think a lot of people have this script in their head and then there's reality, which never matches the script. And if you're unaware of that, it could lead to increased depression because you're expecting something that may not happen. So if you are a person that has high expectations, try to remember reality is different and to take care of yourself by connecting with those that you love, making sure you are exercising and eating right and managing your money and connecting to people so you're not alone if, if that's the case during the holidays. Mm. And remembering the holidays hit everyone differently, right? That's right. That's, That's exactly true. right. Something yeah. for everybody in there. Great advice. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, from social issues to side hustles, young people are turning to Instagram for more than just filters. <laughs> more than just filters. When we return, we'll take a closer look at what matters most to Gen Zers on social media and the trends to watch for in the coming year. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. This morning, Instagram is releasing what it's calling its Gen Z Trend Report for 2023. It features the topics, issues, and trends that are projected to matter most to teenagers in the upcoming year. That's right. And after a year full of movements, memes, and all the feels on social media, what better way to end 2022 than look ahead to 2023? And joining us to do that is Instagram creator DeAndre Brown, also known as the corporate baddie, and Instagram <laughs> creator and activist Deja Fox. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. So I want to start with you, uh, DeAndre. First of all, we're seeing more and more teenagers use Instagram to make cold, hard cash. How effective is that, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that it's very effective, honestly. Um, and I can even just speak from my personal um, opinion and perspective um, as a content creator and as somebody who was working in corporate America as well and just doing both and mm. having like these two side hustles at the same time. And we see now that 64 percent of people are now trying to turn their passion projects into careers. Um, so I think that that's uh, going to be a huge trend, especially amongst Gen Z within 2023. Mm. And Deja, let's bring you yeah. in here and talk a bit about activism on Instagram. Absolutely. A lot of younger people are using the platform to speak up about social issues. What are we seeing there and what are we expecting in the year ahead? Yeah, that's right. I mean, when only 30% of Gen Z is of voting age, 
we're voting with our dollars, with the mm -hmm. brands we're buying, right? We're voting with our follows, the folks we're following and amplifying every day. We're setting the narrative online, right? And it's influencing our elections and our policy. You know, I was just on the ground in Georgia out there creating reels with my friends while we were TikToking, normalizing getting out there voting and taking that next action step. And I know something, and first of all, I love yeah. that you use TikToking as a verb. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> but I know something that a lot of Gen Zers who tend to be out of college and young think about is personal finance and financial literacy. What are we seeing around there? I want to ask you, corporate baddie. Yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure. Um, so just giving some stats, 85% of people plan on utilizing these platforms and just making another form of income within the next year. And we're seeing that, then that comes directly from the Trim Report. And we're seeing that one of those, when we're making these, when we're making money on social media and the way in which we're doing it, it's, you know, by making these, by making content and just putting ourselves out there, you know. Yeah. And I think that it's important, especially Gen Z's, we're now going into we're starting our lives, we're starting our careers. Mm -hmm. And one of those ways now is we're starting to think about, well, now we have to be financially literate and not only just set ourselves up successfully with our careers, but set ourselves up successfully financially as well. Hmm. Really incredible. Very smart and forward thinking. Yeah. Deja, I was wondering about uh, sort of the pitfalls we've seen for social totally. media. The prior generations have definitely fallen into them. Gen Z trying to avoid them. How do they do that? How sure. do they sort of expand their circles in a positive way? Yeah, I mean, I also want to speak to the what you were saying about Gen Z is also building their authenticity mm. and their authority online. I think Instagram is really the place to do that, right? It's this place where you build a deep community. People are engaging with you. They can message you. And we've never seen in the scope of human history a time where anyone anywhere can connect in a moment, mm -hmm. right? This is like an epic change and it's Gen Z's superpower. And we're using these platforms like Instagram to build communities around us of care, communities that help us not only feel personally well, but be professionally successful, right? I've gotten some of my best opportunities from people who I've met online who, you know, I didn't grow up in a household where my dad was gonna get me an internship or my cousin right. was gonna tap me in. I was able to create those connections mm -hmm on platforms like social media and build those relationships and then you know mobilize those personal relationships to really create professional opportunities and social mobility for myself and the people around me. I love that. I look so much, I think, at the negatives of social media. It's yeah. so refreshing to hear such yeah. a positive take of it. A hundred percent refreshing. And I wanted to ask, because I know we said 2023 may be the year of the side hustle. So corporate baddie, is it true? <laughs> and if so, why? Real brief here. Oh, yes, absolutely <laughs> true. And just quickly speaking for me, like I did it as well myself working in corporate America and also um, creating content as well. And that was my side hustle. And we see a lot of other young Gen Zers doing the same as well. So definitely looking forward to those 2023 side hustles. <laughs> and seeing a lot of new content coming out as well. Mm, well, we'll be watching your TikToks and your Reels, DeAndre <laughs> Brown uh, and Deja Fox. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you for having us. All right, more financial headlines now. One of tech's big names in investing in more manufacturers in the U.S. That's right. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us now to talk about this. Good morning, Silvana. Zinkley, good morning, Stephen. Good morning to you as well. The world's largest chip maker, Taiwan Semiconductor, announcing today it's tripling its investment in the United States. The company is promising to spend $40 billion on two new manufacturing hubs in Phoenix. The first of those facilities is scheduled to open by next December. President Biden will attend an event today in Phoenix with Taiwan Semi's founder, Apple CEO Tim Cook, and the head of other chip makers to mark the occasion. Taiwan Semi is a key supplier of chips for the iPhone. PepsiCo is reportedly laying off hundreds of workers in its snack and beverage divisions. The Wall Street Journal says the cuts will be heavier in the beverage unit, which is based in New York State. The snack division, which is based in Chicago and Texas, has already trimmed jobs through a voluntary retirement program. In a memo sent to staff, PepsiCo says the layoffs are aimed at simplifying and making its operations more efficient. In October, PepsiCo said it was cutting costs amid worsening economic conditions. Microsoft is raising prices for new video games for the Xbox. Starting next year, the company will charge $69.99 for new first-party and next-generation games such as Starfield and Forza Motorsport. Previously, those games cost about $10 less, 
The move comes after roughly two decades without price increases from major game publishers, guys. So add it to the list of things that have going up in price. <laughs> it's a long list. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Silvana, thank you so much. You got it. All right, turning now to a revolutionary new art exhibit in Brooklyn that's celebrating the lives of those who died as a result of police violence. That's right. NBC News Washington correspondent Yamichelle Sindor has that story. It's a space celebrating birthdays that never were. Love you. Just know we miss you terribly. An art exhibit in Brooklyn. 1-800-HAPPY-BIRTHDAY, focused on people killed after encounters with the police. For each of the 12 celebrants, as they are called here, there's a phone booth featuring details about their lives and voices of their loved ones. There's Oscar Grant, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland. Hey, sis, I just want to tell you happy heavenly 35th birthday. At Tony Robinson's phone booth, it's his grandmother singing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. His aunt, Lolo, says Robinson, who was killed by police in Wisconsin at 19, loved celebrating his big day. He liked to have fun. He would always be the one to keep us together and bring us together. His family cherishes seeing his legacy live on here. It's powerful. They have created a, an actual space where we're not reduced to these hashtags. The exhibit's artistic director says that is the goal. And the idea is to shift the lens and to bring light to these people as, um, as individuals and not as headlines and to get some insight into who they were as people, not just victims. Visitors who come can also leave their own messages. Happy birthday, Sandra. Sorry that I have to leave this kind of voicemail under these kind of circumstances. An experience with lasting impact. The exhibition for me, I mean, it really brings it home. Brings what home? Brings the horror, the absolute horror of black young people basically, in my opinion, being shot every damn week. Personal items are also featured. These are the clothes they wore, their jerseys, their shoes, like their favorite items. An exhibit to celebrate lives and not mourn their deaths. Yami Shal Sendor, NBC News, Brooklyn. Very important topic. Thanks, Yamisha, for that. Well, coming up this morning, some think it's cool. Others say it's pretty creepy. Up next here on Morning News Now, we'll talk about a new kind of chat bot that has people divided. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A new online chat bot is making waves on social media for both its precise and also <laughs> painfully honest <laughs> answers. It's called Chat GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, and it's fully <laughs> powered through artificial intelligence. Just rolls off the tongue. Uh-huh. Joining us now to talk about this is NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt. Good to see you, Callan. So most of us have used chatbots for things like customer service questions. Can be a little frustrating. <laughs> so what makes this one different? So this chatbot is really unique in that you can use sort of natural language in order for uh, in order to ask it a question. So you're asking this thing, uh, you know, how do I um, code a website? But could you describe it to me as a valley girl? And you don't have to use this like really contrived language. It's very funny in that you can ask it to do things like um, explain something to me as Snoop Dogg lyrics or in a limerick. And it <laughs> understands what you're saying and will sort of respond with these very um, natural language responses. So it kind of takes that sort of contrived nature of um, AI out of the equation and makes it almost like you're talking to a person, which when you're talking to uh, a chatbot for a company, it can be a little frustrating when it feels like you're not getting a, a response from a human being. This kind of sounds like you're talking to a person. Wow, I think I'm erring on the creepy side of all of this, Callan. <laughs> so what are some of the consequences though, risks of people not realizing about talking to this new chatbot? So some of the concerns about this chatbot being so intelligent and being kind of being able to ask it any question is what if someone, uh, a bad actor, asks it a question to sort of um, how do I build, uh, you know, a device for nefarious purpose, purposes? How do I, um, you know, potentially build a homemade explosive device? And some researchers have tried what I've been told is a pretty common test, which is they've asked it how to build a Molotov cocktail. Now they had to get around a few content sensors and they were able to do so. And they were able to get the bot to explain how to build a Molotov cocktail. Apparently another one of these tests is um, how to 
hotwire a car. So these are some tests that researchers and programmers use to see like, where is the bot at? Where's the content filter at? And, and um, OpenAI who built chat GPT uh, has said that, um, you know, they know it's not perfect yet, that there are going to be some issues with it and they're still working out the bugs. So this is hopefully just a temporary issue, but it's one that is uh, really troubling some researchers and programmers. And Kellen, I know when we talk about tech, sometimes we'll talk about it in the context of replacing people. So will other companies try and duplicate the capabilities of the chatbot almost to put us out of a job one day? Briefly here on this. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, people are already saying that ChatGPT is uh, the new Google. So I think some people who uh, either run search engines or who have built search engines may be looking to this as the future. I mean, some people have said it's made it their way, it's made its way to their um, iPhone's home pages where they're using it already as a search engine. So I think we may see this technology popping up in search engines in the future. Well, time will tell there. Hopefully mm. they won't. I know they've <laughs> talked about uh, AI replacing us, actually. Oh. Anchors. Yeah, that was a story <laughs> back in the day. But hopefully that won't happen. Callan Rosenblatt, yes. thank you so much. And that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.